Welcome to lecture 9.6 on the chain and power rules and this is for calculus for business and social science. So before we begin um, talking about the chain rule, I want to do a little review of composite functions from algebra. This is a very simple concept and most things that happen in life actually happen around a, um, more of a composite function. And the idea here is that you have functions that are stacked. So your first input is x, it goes into this function g. What comes out, remember, is the y value or g of x. And this value then goes into function f. So your y value here isn't f of x, it's f of the input, which is actually the output from g of x. So it's f of g of x. Okay? Now that sounds a little confusing, so let's look at a very simple example. Anyone that has a job that uh, makes an hourly wage, you know how this works. You work so many hours, let's say you work um, 20 hours. Let's say your payroll function pays you $10 an hour. So 20 times 10 gives you $200. Do you get that at home? No. Because that gross pay then goes into another function, which is your taxes and benefit function, which based upon how much money goes in, you get um, less money out, right? So this is a very simple example of a composite function. Now let's look at it um, algebraically. So <clears throat> our function g is to square the input and add 2. So notice when we plug in x, our g of x would equal x squared, square the function, and add 2. So our function g is simply x squared plus 2. That's what's coming out. Now our function f says double the input minus 3. So a normal function f of x would be 2x minus 3, right? Double the input minus 3. But remember when we have a composite function, wherever we have an x in this outer function, we're going to put the inner function, which is the g of x. Or you can see here x squared plus 2. So we substitute in x squared plus 2, always in parentheses, and then subtract the 3. And we can reduce this by just doing the algebra. Okay. So see if you can do this problem. Hit pause and, and see if you can first find the composite. This is good practice. And then second, see if you can find the derivative. Hit pause and try this on your own. It should only take a couple minutes. It's a simple derivative. All right. <clears throat> so notice we're trying to find the function f of g of x. So our input to f of x is 2x minus 1. All right. So we're going to plug in 2x minus 1 wherever there's an x, which is inside a square. So remember, always put that in parentheses. So we get 3 times the parentheses of g of x, 2x minus 1. And that x is squared, so our g of x is squared. If we multiply this out, FOIL it out, we get 12x squared minus 12x plus 3. I'm not going to go through those steps. You should be able to FOIL and all that good junk. Okay. So here our derivative is a very simple thing. Um, the, we take the derivative of each piece. Where am I at? There I'm at. We get 24x minus 12 plus 0, and so there's the derivative. I'm not going to spend much time on that. Okay? So the chain rule is how we take derivatives of composite functions. Okay? It seems a little confusing at first, and this explanation will probably confuse you a little bit more. But then I think I have a simple strategy for helping you get through these um, in a more um, intuitive and straightforward way. So the idea here is that if we're taking, um, we have a, an int, a derivative, right? So we're trying to take the integral of that. And if this equals um, the, let me read this because this will help me explain it better. If f and g are both differentiable functions, so y equals f of u and u equals g of x. So notice what this is saying, y equals f of g of x. So y is a, is a composite function. Then it's saying that y is also a differentiable function of x, because we're plugging in x where the u is here. So we find y prime, the derivative, by taking the derivative of x with respect to u and multiplying that times the derivative of g with respect to x. Okay. So the way it looks is that dy, du, taking this derivative with whatever variable's there, 
times this derivative uh, with respect to x gives us the total derivative. Now, composite functions aren't written with two different um, variables. We actually use this u as a substitution. Okay? But what this is saying is if we take the derivative of the outer function, which is the uh, f of x on the outside, and to multiply that times the derivative of the inner function, we'll actually get our derivative. Okay? okay. So let's look at this. And so the, one of the big things with the chain rule is figuring out what's on the outer and what's on the inner. And it's really not that complicated because most of them have parentheses, etc. So if we have f of x equals 3x squared and g of x equals 2x minus 1, notice then our composite function is 3 times the quantity of 2x minus 1 squared. Hey, that's the one we just did, okay? So we already know what this answer is for the derivative when we multiply it out. But we want to use the chain rule to solve this same problem. So don't multiply this out and solve that. We want to find the chain rule. So remember we're making u equal um, the inner function, 2x minus 1, right? Because this is our g of x. And notice the outer function is a power, which is that u squared. It should be a 3 there, too, because there's a coefficient. Ah, there it is. And notice there's a constant multiple of 3, which, of course, we can pull out in front. So our answer is 3 times the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. Well, the inner function is the easiest, so let's look at that. The inner function is just 2x minus 1, so what's the derivative there? 2, okay? 3, we've got that as well. Now, the outer function, this is tricky because there's one confusing part here. We ignore what's inside because we've already taken that derivative, or we're going to, with the inner. So we ignore what's inside, just kind of imagine this is a blank box here, so it's a function squared. What would the derivative of anything squared be? We'd pull the, der we'd pull the exponent down in front, 2, times the box, raised to the 1 power. We leave what's inside intact. It's like it's a wrapped present and it's not Christmas yet or whatever, or your birthday. So what's inside stays there. You do not change it. Okay. So notice here we have 3 again. The outer is the 2 comes down in front. What's inside the box does not change. Just the outer part changes 1. And then we subtract 1 from the exponent. And then we, multi then we multiply times the inner function, or which is here. Okay. And so we get 24x minus 12. And if you page back a slide, or I guess you can't page back, what am I saying? If you rewind, or if you remember, this is the exact same thing we got when we multiplied this out. So this is like a little, we've done it two different ways. All right, so let's try some more. Before we do that, I want to give you a simple analogy. Um, I don't know if you've ever eaten at a really fancy restaurant, and there's like tons of silverware, and you don't know which fork and which frickin' spoon to use. But a general rule I've always heard is that you start from the outside and work your way in. That's the chain rule. So think of the chain rule as eating at a fancy restaurant. Start at the outside and work your way in. Okay, so you don't have to go through all those substitutions again. So notice here we have um, y equals the square root of x squared minus 1. So again, it's pretty simple to see that the outer function is the square root, because it's on the outside, and then our inner function is this x squared minus 1. Okay? So remember when we do radicals, we, we tend to rewrite them as um, excuse me, exponentials. So our outer function is something to the 1 half. Remember, what's inside the box stays there. We don't touch that when we're doing the outer derivative, and then the inner derivative is x squared minus 1. So this is actually pretty simple. Remember, outer times inner, work from the outside in. So our outer function is we pull the exponent down, 1 half times what's inside the box stays there. We don't touch the inner of the outer. Remember, it's like Christmas. It's not Christmas yet. And then we subtract 1 from the exponent, get negative 1 half, and then we take now we take the derivative of what's inside the box, which gives us just 2x. If we simplify this, we get um, oh, I see, um, x over the square root of x squared minus 1. Okay, Remember, this is going to go to the denominator. We'll have a 2 in the denominator. We'll have a 2x in the numerator, so the 2's cancel out, and we get this. Okay, Simple algebra. I didn't do the steps there. All right. So let's try another. Okay, see if you can do this one. 
um, hit pause again and try to do it on your own. Okay? Again, do the outer and the inner. Alright. So the outer again is pretty easy to see because we have parentheses. What's inside the parentheses is the inner. Hey, pretty easy. The outer again is simply a power rule. So we're going to pull the power down in front. We're going to pull the power down in front. The 6, the exponent comes down in front. We're going to subtract 1 from that 6. What's in the Christmas box stays in there. We do not touch it. It's not Christmas yet. And then we do take the derivative. That's the second part of what's inside. So we get 2x minus 4. And here's our answer. I think I would just leave it that way. You're not going to foil this out. Okay? Okay, they did multiply the 6 times the second one because you could put it all in there. But I, honestly, either of these would be fine by me. You need to pay attention to the homework and see what um, WebAssign wants. If it wants you to put it inside, put it inside on the test as well. Okay, let's try another one. See if you can do this one on your own as well. Hit pause again. Some cases are tricky looking. Wait, I don't see an outer and an inner. Well, <clears throat> you could do this as a quotient rule, but those are always a pain in the butt, right? Notice if I rewrite this as a power, what exponent would be on the denominator? Negative 1. Right? Because 3 cubed squared plus 1 to the negative 1 means that it's in the denominator. So notice now I've rewritten it as a chain rule, which I actually think is easier than um, the quotient rule. Maybe not with this one, since there's a constant up top. It would become pretty easy. But anyway, let's do the chain rule just for um, kick's sake. All right, so we have the outer and the inner. Again, pretty easy. The outer is the parenthesis with the negative 1 exponent. We have a constant multiple, and then we have the inner, which is what's inside the parenthesis. Very intuitive. Again, the outer, all it's going to be is we're going to pull the exponent down. So we have negative 1 times 4 is negative 4. Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. Be careful when you have negatives here. Um, and then we, have, we do not touch what's inside the box. And then we take the derivative of the inner, which is 6q, 3q squared, pull the 2 down, etc. 1 is 0. And so then we just simplify this. Again, I'm going to put this back where it belongs. I'm going to make it into a rational expression because that's what it was up here. And so I have a very relatively simple derivative again. Okay? All right, let's look at a, what can be a very interesting problem. Now, we started this chain rule by looking at composite functions and then using this notation. And often it helps to use this notation if you think of um, a chain rule as a product of fractions, right? So if I have dy dx, I'm trying to figure out what the derivative of dy dx is, and it's a composite function, so I'm actually taking y with a different function in there, u, some function of, you know, g that's a function of u. And then I've got to take a, that derivative of that function, the g of x, with respect to x. Notice that the du's cancel out and I'm left with dy dx. So it works kind of like a fraction. And that can help us. It's kind of like a cheat or a workaround in a video game where we can kind of get in there and figure out problems this way. So let me throw a problem at you that you'll be going, what? Okay, allometric relationships. The relationship between the length L in meters and weight W in kilograms of a species of fish in the Pacific Ocean is given by W equals 10.375 L cubed. The rate of growth in length is given by DL dt equals 0.36 minus 0.18 L, where T is measured in years. Determine a formula for the rate of growth in weight, DW dt, in terms of L. If a fish weighs 30 kilograms, approximate its rate of growth in weight using the formula found in Part A. Now, I read that really fast because you know, this is how we get overwhelmed when we start reading these problems. They're like, what the hell is going on, right? Like, it, I don't even get this. What are they talking about? It's just craziness. I can't do math. I can't do calculus. What are you talking about? So let's look at the problem and try to get a context. The relationship, let's read it slower in one sentence at a time. The relationship between the length in meters and the weight of a species of fish is given by weight equals 10.375 L cubed. Now what is that saying? As the fish grows longer, the weight is going up. Well, hell, that ain't so hard. As a fish grows longer, it's getting heavier. 
hell, I knew that. And my actually, my dad, my grandfather had a fish business, but that's not why I knew that. You knew that as well. All right. So it's not really so confusing. So one of the things we want to start doing in problems like this is actually pull the information out. And sometimes just rewriting it out of the paragraphs and words can really help. So <clears throat> understand the variables and questions using chain rule notation. So it tells us that the weight equals 10.375 L cubed. I write this again, and I write it in words I understand. You know, I might say weight grows as length grows. How weight is related to length, okay? I get another formula here, DL dt, 0.36 minus 0.18L. This is nice because it's already in um, derivative notation. Now, be care if it said the rate of growth in length is given by just this formula, put use this notation, it will help you. So DL dt equals 0.36 minus 0.18L, and this tells us how a, f how a fish grows, how long does a fish grow over time, right? How does the growth change with time? Okay, how's the, yeah, how's the growth changing with time? Okay, now the question says, determine a formula for the rate of growth in weight, dw dt, in terms of L. And what this is asking is, how does the weight change over time as the length changes? Because it says it wants it in terms of the length. Okay, so we're trying to find dw dt. Notice that we have dl dt. So again, think back to this fraction. We have dw dt equals dl over dt. What do we need here to cancel out? dw, we have this. We need a dw up top because that's what we're looking for. And we need to get rid of this dl because we don't need that anymore. We have the dt in the bottom, so we put it, we, we're looking for dw dl. Okay, hey, look, the weight, um, the original equation gives us W in terms of L. So this is a very easy derivative to find. They gave us the derivative for DL dt. All we have to do is find the derivative for DW dl. Well, if W equals this formula, then W prime, which is DW dl, is simply 3 times 10.375 L squared. Hey, that wasn't so bad. So we put the pieces together, 31.125L squared times that original formula, and we get 11.205L squared minus 5.6025L cubed. Hey, we've done it. So this can really help us with some of these problems, especially if we rewrite it. This one already gave it to us in the problem in terms of the notation, the fractional notation. We had this, we're looking for this, so look at this piece here. We've got to figure out what do we need to find to cancel out the DL up top and get a DAW up top. DW DL, which is the derivative of W with respect to L, which is very simple given this formula. I know when you read that, hell, when I read it, I got confused. And then I realized, hell, it's only telling me that as a fish grows longer, it gets heavier. So first trying to understand what it's saying, taking a little sentence, and then rewriting these formulas out on your page can really help simplify these problems, which seem really overwhelming. So let's go on to part B. Okay. If a fish weighs 30 kilograms, approximate its rate of growth using the formula found in part A. Well, there's our formula for part A, and we know that um, question B, we want to figure out this value when the fish weighs 30 kilograms. Now, a first mistake that almost many students make, and I'd say most of them make, is they simply plug in 30 here. But we have a problem. 30 is the weight, not the length. So be mindful here. When, we, when blah, 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 it weighs 30 kilograms, that's W, that's not L, and our formula here is L. Our change in weight with relationship to the length. So we have to find L when W is 30. Well, this isn't actually hard, but it's an easy way to get, this is how math teachers are mean and everyone hates us, right? We put those sneaky things in there, so you just plug in 30 and then you get the wrong answer. And this problem has already been confusing enough, all right? So pay attention to the problem. And in calculus, it's gonna get more serious because we do wanna mess with you. We want you to be very 
orderly, if you're going to be an engineer or you'd be using this calculus, you need to be, or even in business, in doing any kind of economics and financial calculating, it's important for you to pay attention to the details. So remember our first formula here, w equals 10.375 L cubed. Hey, I can find w if I have the length. So all I have to do is, or I can find length if I have the w. So plug in the w and then calculate it. So of course 30 divided by 10.375 and then take the cube root of that and we get 1.4247. With that now in our wonderful calculators, we can figure out what W of 1.4247 is by plugging it into the formula we found in part A. So this was a little bit tricky again. It was a double tricky problem. First to kind of understand how to solve these problems and then making sure you're paying attention all the way through. Don't fall asleep. Pay attention. Use your scratch paper. Note the formulas. Use the notation you've learned.